Hi everybody, it's Dr. Sandy Kramers at Visionary Eye Doctors for podcast number seven. We're gonna take a little break from talking about general ocular surface inflammatory diseases and disorders and just talk a little bit about how to improve and strengthen your stem cells. And the reason why I wanna talk about this is because it's kind of the foundation of many treatments in ophthalmology and in other areas of medicine. And it's a big passion of mine to talk about this because who want who doesn't want to live a healthy, uh, happier, you know, uh, disease-free life? And as a physician, I of course took the oath to do no harm and of course to help patients. And I think a lot of doctors really sometimes get caught up in here's the drug, good luck, goodbye, and don't get to the base of the problem. So I want you to think of a little bit of paradigm shift. There's a little joke among doctors that you know a doctor's about to retire when they come up with their own diet. And so that's the kind of the idea that there's so many doctors' diets and so many ideas of how to improve stem cells. We're gonna talk about five top ways to improve your stem cells. So the first question is, what is a stem cell? Why is it important? So a stem cell is any cell that can divide and can differentiate. And so those cells are very beautiful because they can turn into multiple tissues. So the biggest stem cell that we talk about, of course, is embryonic stem cells. We all came from an egg and a sperm. They got together and they basically created a new being of dividing cells called the blastocyte. And when these cells get together, they produce cells that can divide and differentiate. And so there's essentially three tiers of, or a hierarchy of stem cells. We call the first tier like a reverse pyramid like this. The first tier is to totipotent, meaning it can become any cell. Then comes pluripotent and then comes somatic cell. So the idea is that when you have an embryonic stem cell, a baby, or I would say embryo, kind of reproducing in the mother's womb, it can be, the, the cells can become any tissue. And that's the beauty of embryonic stem cells. The issue, of course, is that as the, the embryo continues to move on and move on, it starts to become more differentiated. The cells can only become one tissue if they go towards the muscle, or if they go towards the eye, or they go towards the skin, and they become somatic cells. So that's human, human cells, essentially. So these cells are crucial, and we have millions of these cells still in our body. A 90-year-old patient still has stem cells in their body. And we can actually see some of the stem cells under the microscope in ophthalmology. For instance, when we look at an eye under the slit lamp microscope, we see the limbal stem cells around the cornea. So the cornea is the window of your eye, and those limbal stem cells are in charge of regenerating the cornea. So if you get a little scratch in your cornea, you get a foreign body, that can be one of the most painful things you can have because the nerves are exposed, but then your stem cells kind of cover it up to heal it up. So we have stem cells all over our body, in our teeth, in our bone marrow, in our fat. And so what we wanna talk about is how to make those stem cells work better and what we can do with stem cells currently and why, why they're important. So those are the key things of what stem cells are. Uh, stem cells have sometimes a bad rap because of the controversy of embryonic versus adult stem cells. There's essentially two types of embryonic stem cells people should know about. Of course, there's the embryonic stem cells from an embryo. If the baby is, or the embryo has been aborted, or there's, you know, obviously uh, in vitro fertilization, sometimes they'll create embryos and then destroy them to have embryonic stem cells. That is, of course, controversial. The studies really are still lacking to show that embryonic stem cell technology is as effective as adult stem cell technology. There's a second uh, component of embryonic stem cells that is also very promising, and that's the embryonic stem cells in cord blood serum. And so when a baby is born and the baby's with the mother and the placenta is about to be thrown away, the cord blood itself has a bunch of growth factors, even embryonic stem cells that are not controversial because the baby has been born. There's no issue about that. So that's a second type really of embryonic stem cells. And then there's of course the adult stem cells. So every one of you, imagine if you could, let's say you have, you know, you either lose your 
you have an incident and you lose your liver. Well, your liver can regenerate, but let's say you lose an arm. You know, how could we regenerate that arm? Is it possible? And believe it or not, it is possible. And it's what people are working on right now. There's many people out there trying to recreate the pancreas for type one and type two diabetes. The issue is that embryonic stem cells don't seem, the one from aborted fetuses or from in vitro fertilization and aborted fetuses don't seem to hold as much promise as adult stem cell technology to date. And so it's important to think about what we can do to strengthen our own stem cells. So there's a very famous doctor at Harvard who uh, won the Nobel Prize in Medicine, Dr. Joseph Murray, and he goes on record as saying he has harvested his own stem cells and he's harvested the stem cells of his children and grandchildren. And he believes the future of medicine is in the stem cells. And he's probably right. And so right now in the moment we're in history, we have the technology to potentially heal many diseases with stem cells, but the data is still not strong. So while we're waiting for the studies to be done, the prospective randomized controlled double-blinded studies to be done to show which is the best stem cell, it's important to strengthen your stem cells. So I'm gonna tell you one more thing about stem cells before we go on to the five top ways to improve your stem cells. Stem cells, as I mentioned, are all over your body. We know that bone marrow for years has provided an incredible cure for leukemia, lymphoma, multiple myeloma. What that entails is the doctor takes a very large needle, puts it into the bone marrow, usually of the hip, grinds the needle in, and then extracts some stem cells, which is very effective. Your fat actually also has stem cells. And this is not to say that you should become obese, but your fat does have very good stem cells. And there's a lot of papers that seem to indicate that the amount of stem cells per square milliliter is higher with adult fat adipose stem cells compared to bone marrow stem cells. But further, there's an idea that if you have a disease, let's say my bombing gland atrophy, which is this oil-based problem, the fat stem cells may be more likely for the cells to become more like a fat-based type of cell as opposed to bone marrow. Bone marrow is how we get our blood cells, for instance. So if you have a blood disease, maybe the bone marrow stem cells is a better way to get your stem cells. And this, these are questions that people are asking that we don't have great answers to just yet. So what are the top five ways to improve your stem cells? Now, this is obviously, you've heard me say a lot of this before, but I wanna kinda of go into a little bit more detail on some of these. So number one is diet. And we've talked about this multiple times. I'm a big proponent, of course, of the anti-inflammatory diet because your stem cells, we know, get stronger by, you know, in, by fasting, which is very interesting. So when you fast, it actually can kill cancer cells. So many of us, most of us have about 50,000 mutations a day in our DNA. And how is it that some turn into cancer and some don't per patient? There's many patients you'll hear that smoke their whole life and never got lung cancer. And then a patient that never smoked and got cancer. Well, there's obviously many factors involved, but there is something to be said about how certain diets and certain lifestyles can make a big impact on how your stem cells are able to fight off cancer and help you live longer. So diet is a huge component. And when I say diet, I mean really diet and, and number two, intermittent fasting, I'll put it that way. So diet, we talk about the anti-inflammatory diet. There's now hundreds of doctor's diets out there or diets, I've printed out a quick list. Dr. Atkins diet, Dr. Gundry diet, Dr. Furman diet, uh, Dr. Uh, Mormon diet, Dr. Gerson diet. There's all these diets and they're very fascinating and I like writing about them because the stories behind them are quite fascinating. Let me tell you one story, which I've alluded to before. So I mentioned, I think before I had a friend who had this metastatic breast cancer, she found out after her older sister died and she had decided to follow her dead older sister's journal to go do the Gerson diet. And the Gerson diet was a diet that was approved initially or at least used in the United States for many years. But for some reason, Dr. Gerson lost his license and was kicked out to Mexico. And basically his diet was very straightforward. It was basically an organic based diet, no chemicals, no hair products, no uh, furniture polish, but he would recommend the enemas I mentioned before three times a day, which was quite difficult for a lot of patients. Meanwhile, another doctor in the Netherlands named Dr. Mormon had a similar kind of anti-cancer diet. His diet was approved by the Royal Academy of Medicine in the Netherlands as a cancer treatment. 
But for some reason, which is really unclear in the, what I could find uh, on my research, he also was license was withdrawn, kicked out of his country, and they discredited him and he was not allowed to practice his diet. I'm not sure what exactly happened. I don't think either one of the doctors were necessarily kind of saying that's the only treatment, but at the same time, they're trying to maybe improve the patient's chance of fighting off the cancer with diet alone. Then of course comes Dr. Atkins. We all know about the kind of high fat diet. There's Dr. Furman, who's a plant-based diet. And one of our colleagues here, visionary eye doctors, swears by Dr. Furman's diet because he had a history of cholesterol issues in his family. And Dr. Furman's diet is very good at helping patients with cholesterol issues. There's Dr. Gundry's diet, who's a cardiothoracic surgeon who's very much against lectins. And then there's Dr. Longo. So Dr. Longo is my, probably my most favorite doctor of them all because he's a PhD and he actually just narrows it down as an anti-cancer diet to the bare bones of what you should eat and what you shouldn't eat. And what these all these diets agree on is basically some key components. Number one, water is good. <laughs> Drink a lot of water. Number two, omega-3 in terms of wild salmon seems to be very good. Number, that's number two. Number three, green leafy vegetables, organic, is very good. Everything else is kind of controversial, whether you should eat, like tomatoes, Dr. Le Dr. Uh, Gundry says lectins are bad, don't eat anything with nightshades. Peanuts, uh, nuts, you know, every doctor has a different opinion on nuts, especially with allergies and so forth. Same thing with soy, same thing with wheat, of course, or barley. Uh, there's Dr. William Lee, who has a very nice video on YouTube, uh, who was actually a mentee of Dr. Folkman at Harvard, who was also my, uh, my mentor. And I met with Dr. William Lee many times actually at Harvard about a protocol we were using for rosacea. But he has actually a, a different kind of, uh, kind of video. Well, actually it's not different. It's, it's based on an anti-angiogenesis, an anti-inflammatory diet. He has some wonderful, wonderful points about the type of olives you should eat. Each olive has positives and negatives. And so there's three good olives, or there's many good olives, but you want to look for the olives that have the best phenol content or bioactive content against inflammation. Uh, so those are key questions. Lycopene, we, we know the list of like the bioactive ingredients in, in foods like lycopene, which comes from tomatoes. So eating a tomato raw it's not terrible per se, you're not gonna die necessarily, but Dr. Gundry and other doctors would say you increase your inflammation. If you cook it, slow cook it, like 190 degrees for about 30 minutes, your lycopene levels increase. And so when I told a friend of mine this, she said the Italians are so brilliant, they've had it right for years. The slow brewing of tomato sauce actually is very good to help patients, for instance, protect against prostate cancer. So there's been a couple of papers to show that tomatoes redness, their, their lycopene is very helpful with cancer. The same is true with things like blueberries and raspberries and, and, and all types of these very, very dark berries. Their skin in most patients and most, in most cases have a very strong bioactive concentration of antioxidants that help strengthen stem cells and decrease inflammation. So this is the research people are looking at to see which ones are the best. Uh, these diets have not been hit ran head to head so far in terms of randomized control perspective studies, but diet is a big component. Number two is intermittent fasting. And this is where Dr. Longo did a really great study where he took a group of uh, rats that had cancer and he expected both of them to kind of die around the same time in a couple of weeks. And he fasted some of them, starved a couple of the, the one cage and the other cage he gave the typical American diet. And lo and behold, the ones that were starved lived I think three times longer. So we know that fasting strengthens your own cells and kills cancerous cells. So Dr. Longo and Dr. Ger Mormon in the Netherlands and Dr. Gerson in the United States that was kicked out to Mexico have the same component of basically don't forget about fasting. Fasting is a very good component and there's many ways of fasting. I'm personally on the I'm personally on the OMAD diet, which is the one meal a day diet, and it's not easy. It's a good penance, it's good mortification, but we, we have data to say that's actually good for your health also. So along with diet and intermittent fasting, uh, there's of course number three, exercise. And I have many patients who come in with all kinds of chronic conditions, uh, chronic eye pain, for instance, that follow these key three steps and do get better on their own. And so things like gluten-free, dairy-free, sugar-free in the diet, crucial. 
trying to skip a meal, very helpful for your cells. Exercise, I have a couple of patients that swear that when they started doing CrossFit training, their eye pain went away. And my theory is that they were having so much muscle pain around their body that they maybe didn't notice the eye pain. I don't know how to explain that, but there is obviously very important issues with obviously trying to exercise. So the minimum 10,000 steps a day is what we try to do. And if you can't move that much, trying to swim and so forth is very helpful. Number four is sleep. Ideally eight hours of sleep. Uh, catching up on the weekends is not good enough. You really want to get that sleep because it does help your cells recover. And number five is basically decreasing toxic chemicals like smoking. Don't be around smokers. Don't inhale toxic fumes. Try to avoid chemicals if you can. Try to avoid furniture polish. Try to avoid air, air refresheners. These, these chemicals, whenever they go into your body, your body has to fight them. And when they try to fight them, they elicit blood vessels and that causes inflammation in some cases. So even things like hormones, be very careful with hormones because we know that that can change the inflammation of your body. Along with that is your gut flora. When you have a chemical or an antibiotic and you wipe out your gut flora, you can change your whole pattern of the next few years of your life. So there's been data to show that the gut flora determines your chance of autoimmune disease, your chance of cancer, and your longevity. So by improving your gut flora and all the things we talked about, you can strengthen your stem cells. So think about the things you can do. We often talk about going up an incline plane. We don't just, just go necessarily to the top, although I have some patients that you know quit cold turkey. I think I mentioned that my dad, when he was told he was pre-diabetic, literally went one day to the other and started a very strict low carb diet and would go below 50 carbs a day and call me and ask me, you know, how much, how many carbs I thought he had uh, per day. So that's, you know, to, some personalities can do that. But most of us take it step by step and really try each day to park your car a little further from the door of your work or try to take the stairs instead of the elevator or try to not have breakfast or skip dinner, you know, try just a little bit once in a while of these tiny little steps that are good for your body and also for your soul. So I hope this is helpful and I hope you will pass this on and please continue to send me your suggestions and I hope uh, you have a great day. Thank you.